What happens when wealth, power, and tragedy collide in a New York City mansion? Hi everyone, Ken here. Today we are exploring the Barney Mansion in Manhattan. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. In 1851, Charles Barney was born the son of Asheville Barney, a successful Cleveland commission merchant. As his father's business grew, the family relocated to New York City, where Ashbill eventually became the president of Wells Fargo and Company. Fitting for a bank president, Ashbill built an imposing brownstone palace at the corner of Park and 38th. Meanwhile, his son Charles attended Williams College, where he began courting Lily Whitney of the powerful and influential Whitney family, which we have covered in several previous videos. Between the connections afforded to Charles by his father's prominence in the banking industry and his ties to the Whitney family, his success in life was guaranteed. After graduating, he returned to New York City, married Lily, and became a stockbroker at Rogers and Gold. By 1884, he had climbed the ladder to become the vice president of the Knickerbocker Trust Company, where he was eventually named president. He made waves in the banking world as he increased deposits at Knickerbocker's sixfold, earning it the title of the third largest bank in New York. All the while, his father had passed away and handed down the family mansion to him. In the 1880s, Charles hired the prominent architecture firm of McKim, Mead & White to completely rework the interior of the Brownstone Palace. Upon entering the home, you would arrive in the stair hall, where every surface had been faced with marble, save the gilded coffered ceiling. Turning to the side, we can peer through one of the ornately decorated archways to view the dining room directly facing a floor-to-ceiling fireplace decorated with bust on its lower mantle and intricate relief work on its upper mantle framed by stone maidens. To the other side of the dining room, an alcove was separated by box columns, complete with Corinthian capitals as vines creep down from the mirrored, coffered ceiling, allowing more light to reflect into the massive room. Looking back towards the stair hall from the dining room, we can see that the walls are covered in antique European tapestries below an elaborate frieze with murals depicting scenes from antiquity. Coming from the stair hall, we can peel back the tapestry, making our way through the portal to arrive in the living room. From the architect's notes, the walls were finished out with antique Venetian velvet below a gold leaf coffered ceiling framing frescoes. You would have been brought through the living room to await the Barneys in the reception room, which was finished out with a complex assembly of overlapping geometric and floral patterns below a gold leaf coffered ceiling. If you had still not been impressed by the house, the gold room would be sure to dazzle you. Every single architectural element and ornament had been gold leaf from the walls to the ceiling to the fireplace's mantle. Upstairs, we will find the library, with half height bookshelves skirting the room. In the center, a stone fireplace rose below a matching stone cornice, and on the ceiling, a gilded frame contained a dramatic and highly detailed mural. Charles would start his morning in his bedroom. Having breakfast in front of the fireplace, he was known not to dress until midday, only heading into the office after lunchtime. The Barneys seemed to have the perfect life. They were well respected in their social circles and were well respected by the public for their contributions to the arts and to the zoo but nothing could prepare them for what was about to happen. On October 15, 1907, Charles partnered Knickerbocker with speculators in an effort to control the United Copper Company by cornering the market. This plan, if successful, would have created new copper barons in each investor in a single day. But something did not go as planned. The timing was off and the plan backfired as the United Copper Company saw its stock value plummet. This caused several banks, including Knickerbocker, to lose a lot of money. Investors began pulling funding and Charles was pressured to tender his resignation. Within days, as news spread, a bank run was triggered as people withdrew their entire life savings, which caused Knickerbocker to fail. This led to the subsequent panic of 1907, in which the New York Stock Exchange fell over 50%. Thankfully, Charles was well diversified and was able to escape the panic with about two and a half million dollars left over, the modern equivalent of over 80 million dollars. Even though he was fine financially, his poorly timed actions had caused thousands of people to lose their livelihoods. After a month had passed by, he was still unable to shake his intense feelings of guilt and shame. On November 14th, Charles woke up like any other day, choosing to have breakfast in his bedroom before shooting himself in the stomach. From various accounts, 
it seems that he had aimed for and missed his heart. He survived, with his wife rushing to his side, followed by a team of lawyers who had him sign any and every imaginable estate planning form in case he should pass away from the injuries. Later that afternoon, the doctors arrive and prep for surgery in Charles' bedroom in an attempt to remove the bullet. The pain was too much for Charles to handle as the doctor began exploratory surgery, so he was placed under anesthesia, which, at the time, was an incredibly risky and still experimental act from which he never woke up. His house was passed down to his son and ended up catching on fire. Faced with costly repairs and a limited budget, his son sold the Brownstone Palace to developers who tore it down and replaced it with an apartment building. What did you think about this mansion? Did you have a favorite room? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a very special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen and show your support for the production of these videos, join our membership program for just $5 per month. I'll see you next time on This House.